podcast we've got the kennel master with us ladies and gentlemen it's mr footscray 350 games of afl footy he's a charles sutton medalist ladies and gentlemen we've got douglas james hawkins Dougie. welcome to the podcast oh that is a magnificent rap thank you paul for that and maddie and uh who we we got maddie who's our uh, who's our special guest yeah, look, our special guest today is uh, the bald eagle himself, Nathan Eagleton. I tell you what, poor Matty. Um, when Nathan Eagleton was playing at Port Adelaide, I just started on Channel 7 and I was doing the commentary. I was doing the special commentary with Jared Healy, uh, Sandy Roberts and Bruce McAvaney. It was Richmond and Port Adelaide at, at Footy Park. And here was my big chance to show the public that I know my footy. I said, Nathan Eagleton, he's a member of the 100 metre club. He carries the ball 30 and he kicks at 60. <laughs> it's only 90. <laughs> Jerry Healy said, Hawk, that's only 90. I said, yeah, the ball drops short and the goal square and rolls 10 metres. There's your... <laughs> Good save. <laughs> so that's Nathan Eagleton. He was a uh, great ball carrier, uh, natural left footer. Um, remind me a little bit of Tony McGuinness, who'd come across from Glenelg to the Bulldogs. Mm. Um, that type of player could kick right foot if he had to, uh, Nathan Eagleton. Um, but I, I just remember this kid when he first started at Port Adelaide, um, and then obviously we got hold of him. Um, his ability to find that that um, that gap or get away out of traffic, he was quick, geez, he was quick, and his ability to kick the ball 50 60 meters was terrific. It really was terrific. And uh, he accumulated the footy, knew how to win the footy. Um, he, he was a very, very good player, Nathan Eagleton, boys. He'd be a great modern-day player, Dougie, wouldn't oh, he? Oh, oh, oh. Paul, you hit it on the head. Imagine him playing now down at Marvel with the roof over the top. Yeah. No wind, no rain, and uh, uh, find a bit of space. Find that bit of space. Um um, no, you're right, Paul. He'd be a, he'd be a modern day star, as he was a star in his own time. H- how many games did he play, Matty? Would he, did he play a uh, hundred at the Bulldogs? Oh, you, you're going to be blown away with this. In total, he played 277, wow. but 221 of them were at the Dogs. God, so say that again. 277 in total, because the 56 of them were at Port Adelaide before he transferred. Uh, what did he play at the Dogs? 221. Gee whiz. Yeah, surprising, right? How many years is that, Manny? He must have played um fifth um th- eleven years at the doggies. He was he was with us from two thousand to two thousand and ten. How'd you go with that, Paul? Did you know that? Two hundred and twenty one uh, games? All I remember, Dougie, is that he was a, a staple on you know, in a Bulldogs team for a long time watching the Bulldogs. He he but he's a he was a beautiful footballer to watch, wasn't he? He was so classy as well. I think he just had a class about him and, and uh, stood out, didn't he? Well, he did, Paul, Matty. He was actually a footballer. He, he was a footballer. He just had that footy brain, footy head, and knew where to go, where to get, uh, and just had the ability to win the footy. And, you know, and if you ever had the ball and you wanted to handball to someone to, 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 to finish it off for you, guess what? It was Nathan Eagleton. He was a finisher. He was a finisher. Make no mistake about it. He wasn't scared. He was happy to go get his own footy. But if you if if you know if the like a Grant and Western these sort of blokes, he'd be the bloke you give it to because he's a great kick, fantastic kick. If you're in the forward line, you have got Nathan Eagleton coming down the ground, you will be going your little beauty. <laughs> Huggy, what posi did he play? Was he a wingman? Or was he a half forward? What was his role, Matty? Yeah, he, look, he mainly played off the wing. So you know when you've got West and Liberatore in the middle. You know, just shooting, just shoveling the ball out. You know, what a, what a luxury to have a racehorse on the outside to be able to just bomb the ball, as Dougie says, you know, 60 metres, you know, without fail and, you know, hit a dime. You know, it's uh, it's a pretty good luxury. How many goals did you say, Matty, he kicked? He's a bit of a goal kicker too, wasn't he? So he's played 220 games. He would have he would have kicked a few goals, yeah? Yeah, he kicked 231 out of the 277. It's almost a goal a game. He kicked 230 goals as well. <laughs> 
<laughs> he must have played poor half forward flank as well, surely. He he couldn't have got all those goals on the wing. I mean, he didn't play on ball because they had a great on ball side. Uh, he must have, he must have, geez, he must have, God, that's a lot of goals, isn't it? For, uh, if he played mainly wing and I got a feeling he, uh, he played a bit forward, didn't he? Surely. Yeah, he definitely crept forward, you know, a lot. Um, but, you know, probably if you watch some of his highlights, a lot of his goals were long range goals, you know, kicking from outside the arc or right on it, you know, as you say. So, you know, just that release ball, you know, like a, like a suckling or, um, you know, some of the, the dogs players yeah. would just take those outside ones and from one step just launch. And that was, uh, you know, he could he could deliver a, a bomb. Did you know, Paul, how, Matty, Paul, how we, um, how we got him from Port Adelaide? Because he must have been still fairly young at the start of his career. How did we get Nathan Egan and the Bulldogs? Yeah, so he, he actually developed a condition, Wolf Parkinson disorder. Heart, um, it's correct, yeah. Yeah. That's right. So I think there were a lot of question marks around around his health at that time, and there was a risk. And I think probably the dogs, you know, offered we offered up Brett Montgomery from memory um, as a swap, and um, and Port jumped at that. Um, so so you know we were as it turned out, what a, what a fortuitous selection because not only did we get you know two hundred and twenty games, Monty came back to us a few years later, so we got both of them. <laughs> exactly. Did Monty play in that premiership, Matty? Did, did Monty play in that premiership at Port Adelaide? He did. He did. He played in the premiership and then he came back and, you know, probably, you know, got played a few finals for us. So, you know, he almost doubled it up. But, um, you know, so this is an example where it just works out. A trade works out for both clubs and both players. But I think we comfortably won that deal, um, you know, when, 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 when we got uh, Brett back. Yeah, good, good call, Matty. Paul, I, I, I forgot about that. He was crook, wasn't he? He had that heart issue and, uh, and and we didn't know what where he was out with it and uh, um, I got he might have fainted on the ground he might have fainted one stage Matty, Matty in, in a game at Port Adelaide and um, just just suddenly hit the deck um, but gee whiz uh, you're right it was a, a fantastic pickup and uh, he turned out to be uh, he, he actually was a star player wasn't he a, a star player he also uh, didn't have a lot of injuries he had a fairly consistent Game per mm, year over mm, his career, guys. Mm. No, he did poor. He didn't didn't seem to get in, uh, injured a lot. And again, uh, again, he just had this ability. Uh, he had super balance. He was just one of those balanced players that very rarely knocked off his feet. Very rarely went to the ground. Wasn't great overhead. I don't think he needed to be because his ability was to carry the ball. As I said before, tuck the ball under your, under your arm and run, and then kick it long. And he just break up all those. Just break up the holes in the, into that forward line, and uh, he was a terrific player, Nathan Eagle. To make no mistake about that, fantastic bulldog. Two hundred twenty games. Wow, yeah. that's a lot. It's fantastic. And um, do you know what I'm hearing right now? It's his doorbell. Cool. We're going to bring in Nathan Eagleton, champion. Good on you, Nath. Good, good, good on you, brother. Good thanks, on you, thanks, mate. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Matty. Great work again. Okay, welcome back to Inside the Kennel podcast and Inside the Kennel listeners. Today's guest played 277 AFL games, kicked 231 sensational goals, played 11 electrifying seasons at the Kennel. It's the bald eagle himself. Welcome to the show, Nathan Eagleton. Cheers, Paul. Thanks very much for having me, mate. From Adelaide, so uh, yeah, I've been back here ever since. We uh, left, uh, lost those three prelims, mate. So uh, jumped in the car <laughs> and went home to family and friends. And, yeah, you uh, went home and went, went in the fetal position, mate. Yeah, I know. Yeah, it was a bit like that. So <laughs> couldn't couldn't get to that uh, final hurdle, but uh, no, nah, had some uh, great times, as you said. Eleven years over there, three years with the power to start my career, and I uh, no, loved every minute of it. And yeah, so. mate, we're going to ask you a heap of questions about that, Matty. Where do you want to start, mate? Well, welcome aboard, Nathan. We want to start by asking you, as we do with all our guests, how would you describe yourself as a player for those people who never got to see you play? And also, is there any current Bulldog players that you would kind of link yourself to or be similar to? Oh, well, um, yeah, it's always a tough one to link yourself to players, but um, oh, obviously played on the wing, sort of did a bit of everything at the Bulldogs. So wing, half forward, I was a tagger for a bit there when I was trying to get back into the side. Um come across as a midfielder sort of stuff. And uh, so, yeah, just sort of jumbled my way through and different coaches came through and put me in different spots and sort of tried to make it work. And uh, 
to try and carve out a sort of 10 plus uh, year career at the Dogs and yeah, got got over that 221 games there. But um, yeah, just a sort of long left footer, as Doug Hawkins would say. I know it's a uh, 100 metre player, but uh, I think he did that once on the, on Channel 7 and uh, uh, run 30, kick 60, which uh, didn't get to the 100, but uh, that's the hawk for you. But uh, no, it was a... Um, a good good time over there. Loved every minute of it. And played with some amazing uh, Footscray footballers. And uh, and uh, as I said, yeah, wasn't lucky enough to uh, had a fair stretch there, three prelims, but just yeah, just couldn't get it done towards the end there. Wow, mate, mate. This is my question. I, I I get to ask all all our guests, and I love it. Firstly, tell me about who your inspirations and mentors were when you were growing up. The second part of this question is, you know, what's it like growing up? and playing football in South Australia and being in Victoria, we know it's a passionate football uh, state. So what was it like uh, sort of growing up in that culture? But to begin with, who were the people that got you up and about and inspired you and got you to the level you, you know, you're at? Yeah, it was probably pretty a bit of a weird one, but my um, old, old man is obviously a huge hero of mine and, uh, and didn't play much football, but um, he loved the game of AFL. He was originally from Melbourne. So I grew up in Blackburn. Uh, barrack for the Hawthorne Footy Club, and um, he sort of put me on this journey of watching Johnny Platten. So he was sort of my idol growing up, and really loved the way he went about it, sort of uh, in and under. And then back in those days, when I used to come over from Adelaide to Princess Park and watch him, they used to be like uh, like a foot of mud that they used to run around in there. And uh, back in the day, so um, yeah, sort of John Platten was the hero, obviously my man, my old man. And um, over here, sort of barracks were. Uh, just watching the journey of sort of wanting to play A grade football for Happy Valley Footy Club it was probably those guys that I looked up to. wasn't really huge into the um, SNFL, um, watching those guys play around, but obviously some great ones running around in that competition. Craig Bradley before he went over, uh, the Kern Hands, all those guys at Glenelg, um, and then it's probably till I didn't get till I got to West Adelaide when I realised some of the good West Adelaide footballers that I sort of you wanted to become. Obviously, Rashudo was there earlier, and uh, Sean Rand, a few of these guys were running around playing for uh, for West Adelaide, moving to the Crows, and then um, and that's sort of where the guys that I was sort of inspired to sort of be and working my way through to one to one day. And that was obviously my goal as a kid was to get to that stage and lucky enough to get there, which was which was great. And um, and then, yeah, carve out a bit of a career. So sort of those got names along the way. One of our guests, uh, mate, is is Tony McGuinness. We, we, we did a wonderful interview with him. Was he someone, I know he's very much in the early days, was he someone that sort of led the path with, as you were a little kid, maybe picked up on? Yeah, yeah. So um, probably I went to that first ever Hawthorne versus the Crows game in 91, oh. back in the day at Footy Park, 40,000. Just got really inspired for that one. Uh, the Crows ended up, winning that game and uh, McDermott got knocked out and it was a, it was a fair bit going on. And uh, um, I probably left that game a Crow supporter after that and then probably watching <laughs> Tony McGuinness and us, and then um, ended up going to a lot of the Crows games from them. So for the next sort of five years, uh, supporting the Crows and, and really, because there was a team in town now. So from 91 as a sort of 13, 14 year old, you wanted someone to sort of um, idolise and look up to and then probably became, yeah, a bit of a Crow supporter. Um, through that journey was really um, wanting to look up to them and getting to them games as much as I could. Uh, travel down to Footy Park, a bit of a hike from where I was, but um, yeah, it's uh, it's really great now. The venues Adelaide Oval and all these local kids around here get to just get down, get on the tram, get to Adelaide Oval and watch some of the footy that they uh, they put on these days, which is great to watch. Nathan, what was it like playing for the new franchise? You um you ended up uh, starting your career off at uh, at Port Adelaide. What was it What was it like? And um. And further to that, how did your career progress so that you ended up being traded to the doggies? Yeah, so it happened pretty quick for me. So I was what was I went from the Teal Cup 17s program, um, and I was nowhere near the scene at that stage. And then I did a pre-season with the West Adelaide League uh, League, and then played a league game. And then the, the whole AFL system changed to an under 18s comp. So and then I got an opportunity there to play some footy. Um, uh, come over to Melbourne and played in the state comp, uh, played in the carnival. Um, Russell Ebert was my coach, and uh, and uh, we uh, about ten of us from that that team actually got put onto the Port Adelaide list. So I didn't get drafted as a certain number or anything like that. Um, the SANFL uh, allocated thirty players from their competition to go onto the um, onto the Port Adelaide list. 
I was one of those 30 and there's about 10 of us that played in that 18 system. So they just sort of picked the, uh, the crop of the SA talent um, within that, within that year. Uh, lucky enough to, um, uh, Jack Hale was obviously the coach. Um, he didn't mind uh, me just getting the footy, kicking it long, seemed to work for his game plan. And, um, and I played 18 games in my first year. So uh, pretty much just went bang uh, onto the scene, which was, uh, was pretty crazy as an 18, 19 year old. And then uh, compared to what the lads might take a little bit more time this year, uh, these days, but um, and that's probably with a new, new uh, team it sort of helped me as well a little bit to uh, make sure there was some talent, young talent in the team moving forward. So, and then, um, uh, well, that, that last year was a bit of a, bit of a weird one for me. Um, Wolf Parkinson White syndrome fell over, gave way a free kick in the square, um, and uh, and uh, had uh, had to have surgery on on the heart and uh, sort of missed footy for a month. Uh, it was the back end of the season, sort of had four or five weeks to go. Got back into the Port Adelaide side and we played a played a final against North Melbourne. We got beaten and then um, and then every uh, and my manager said sort of every club in the in the country was uh, was asking about me. So um, mm. did a bit of a did a bit of a look around and, uh, and had a few meetings and um, was lucky enough to fly into Melbourne. Met Rowan and Brad so and uh, and Terry Wallace at Adelaide uh, Melbourne Airport. Flew in, had a discussion. Had met them before the year before because I um, was lucky enough to go to the international rules and play with some crazy footballers. And back back in that day, I went to Ireland and as a nineteen year old and did that international rules system. Um, and then came back, met those guys along that journey. And then to play under the roof and uh, at, at Colonial back in the day, that was sort of the message, yeah. which was pretty good for, didn't mind that um, kind of idea and the new new stadium. And that's where it uh, sort of all came about. And the trade with Brent Montgomery and did full circle and then come and play with him in the back end of his career as well. So it's, um, yeah, I think Brent Guerra went as, the, uh, as another pick they got for me as well. So, yeah, it was a, um, a weird time. Uh, but um, I probably took it as, as a 19, 20 year old that uh, Port Adelaide were keen to put me on the table. Then I was look, keen to have a look around, and that was the best decision I ever made to stay around the dogs for that long and have a, and carve out a career over in Melbourne. It was great to get out of Adelaide as well and uh, and see a different part of Australia and Melbourne's heart of footy, which was uh, which is awesome as well. As a 19, 20 year old, they'd offered me a two year deal. I got a three year deal at the, the Bulldogs, and it was. Um, that was enough uh, enough time for me to actually get over there, uh, work work out Melbourne, uh, and then and sort myself out and uh, and make sure that I could uh, have an impact at the club. So, yeah. Yeah. on the long run, it actually worked out. But a uh, little, little little touch and go there early. So, but uh, worked through that and, uh, and got it done. So, well, it certainly did. So, fifty six games at Port, a rising star nominee, and then we, we you land at the Kennel. What was it like walking through the doors for that first time? And, what was the comparison, I guess, between your old club and the new? Um, yeah, it was just, uh, both both clubs had played finals that year and, um, and probably 97, 98. So they wanted to make a few changes at the dogs with um, getting some younger guys through and the draft that we came through was I was just a couple of years older than obviously the likes of Gia and, uh, and Murphy and um, Mitch Hahn, Hargraves, all this crew that we sort of played some good football for a good 10 years together. So... All those guys, Lindsay Gilby, like the, the list goes on that we sort of. So I was a couple of years older than those guys, as eighteen-year-olds are coming into the system. So, and obviously Nathan Brown was there as well, the same age as me. So, um, and then we sort of had a had a good little crew there, sort of uh, working our way through. But um, yeah, it was um, it was it was challenging, but um, exciting, and uh, it seemed to uh, yeah, early days came in wanting to play sort of midfield time, but it was. Wasn't easy to get into that midfield with the Westy, Liberatore, Jose Romero, um, all those Rowan going through there, Brad. So I sort of had to bite my time a little bit and uh, play a bit of footy, half forward wing, and and then wait for the opportunity. So um, and it eventually sort of got there. Yeah, yeah, and um, I guess playing on the half forward line was really fortuitous because just in your thirteenth game, you slammed through seven goals, which was a career <laughs> high um, against yeah. the Cats. Can you tell us a bit about that game? Yeah, no, I think they that call was, that the yeah. breakout game, Nathan. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I was sort of sort of playing that half forward and uh, opportunities and uh, kick seven goals three in a losing side, but um, yeah. that was definitely a shootout one twenty five to um, I don't know one twenty three or something. So it was a close one. Buddock Hocking got one late, I reckon, to uh, to seal the game for for Geelong. But always played some pretty pretty good footy against Geelong. Um, 
yeah, it's just one of those things. It happens on occasions, and I've sort of had bags of threes and fours, but to get that uh, opportunity to to kick seven and and sort of just kept finding my way and uh, getting in the right spots and uh, probably had a bit of a leash on the, my opponent on a couple of occasions and it got changed a few times, but uh, no, definitely uh, definitely a highlight. I've still got that Guernsey. I've never washed it and it's still hanging up at, that, at home. Uh, Mum and Dad have got it somewhere, so it's um, definitely one of the ones that uh, I cherish for sure. But wow. once again, we lost that day, but uh, yeah, it is what it is. You don't lose very often having kick seven goals in, yeah. in a game, do yeah. you, mate? No, nah, exactly right. I think I had a shot and uh, kicked a point late to uh, probably get us another couple of goals up, but uh, still, uh, it still wasn't to be. But uh, I know shootouts back there at Colonial, so up and down, and uh, wasn't the uh, the deck wasn't the best. It was probably a fair bit of a uh, fair bit of uh, grass getting chewed up and all that sort of stuff. But uh, no, it uh, it it was uh, definitely a highlight for me in the uh, in the time over there. And you had to pretend to be sad in the rooms. Was that was that difficult? Uh, I was, I think it was late in the season, I think, but, um, yeah, I think as well, I think uh, I remember Tuesday, I think I, 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 I didn't train on the first, on the Tuesday going back. I was on the massage table and, and Plow said, oh, you deserve that one. Anyway, I'll let that one go I slide through you, uh, <laughs> not train on the following Tuesday. So yeah, it was a, uh, it was a, it was a good day out, but, uh, no, I didn't get the four points, which is disappointing. Uh, you ended your career under Peter Rhodes at the club and we know that era wasn't great, uh, the club wasn't at its best, and then, but for you, it was good. You started finding form. You started finding consistency in playing good football. You moved on with Rocket Eid, and then you really stretched out and started being a very good player. What? How did those two coaches have an effect on your on your playing career? Yeah, so obviously the change happened with Terry Terry Wallace. Uh, it was a pretty crazy time at the club, uh, and uh, Peter Road was the um, he was the fitness advisor at the time. So, and he'd obviously coached premierships at uh, at Norwood in. Uh, uh, before getting going over to Melbourne, so he took the reins for I think just under I think two seasons just under. But um, so that's probably where the flip happened. That um, I was I was probably playing half forward, um, not getting opportunities to play through the uh, through the midfield, and sort of sort of went to went to um, uh, Peter and sort of said oh, I need and and Chris Bond who was the midfield coach, and so I need an opportunity, here, guys. Otherwise, I'm 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 not not sure if I'll, I'll be around much longer and. Uh, the opportunity came to sort of start playing on some players and tagging and uh, and sort of playing some run with roles. So playing on players, playing off them, and I don't reckon I was in the side the first sort of eight or nine games of that uh, first year of um, of uh, uh, of Peter Rowe because obviously I thought the same match committee was there as Rocket uh, as, as as Terry. So probably took me a little bit longer to actually get them to make that change and opportunity to tag, play on some of the good players. Uh, cousins, all the likes. So Harvey was still running around playing footy. So um, yeah, Peter Burgoyne was one of the good footballers for the Port Adelaide at the time. So playing on Nick Stevens, all these sort of roles that I was getting, mm -hmm. and I was able to sort of stop them from what they were doing. And I was hitting the scoreboard and getting two or three shots on goal and getting my 20, 25 plus touches and having a real impact. So that sort of sort of turned it for me quite a bit. And then um, and then uh, that was. Uh, and then I got a I got a lot of went at the age where you start turning twenty five, really believing in yourself and your ability, mm -hmm. and and Rodney E come into place, and then then we sort of went from hand the ball, handball and the ball the ball back to actually let's get the ball going forward and let's play with some momentum and just yeah. and just play play some fast exciting brand of footy, and and that's where the change came, and that was sort of played into my lap a little bit yeah. on the wing and sort of through the midfield, so um, I'm happy to play off the back of the square before the six 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 came in and sort of playing with those sort of guys and we sort of just run and create from there and just really knew the second half would really come into my own because of my fitness ability and yes and, um, and teared up some games and played some really really good football with hey, some some talented footballers that we had in our team at that stage so um and then as i said three prelims and we probably the year we missed the missed out on the prelims it was a year that we were really really playing some really good footy under under rocket and uh, well, I think we all went to Yarraville uh, Bowls Club and watched Essendon play. Um, they couldn't against Melbourne. They couldn't get over the line, and then we missed out on playing finals. But if we'd got in that year, I reckon we could have had a fair crack at knocking a few teams off and coming from eighth or seventh, probably what the boys did in sixteen, and and and, and having some real momentum. And I'm sure a few of those clubs wouldn't have liked us playing in that year. I think it was yeah, 06, I reckon so yeah. or 07. Mm. Yeah. 
And um, and just on 2005, it sounds like you reinvented yourself in, in, in that sort of that 2004-05 era. And I remember a real statement game. If that uh, if that wasn't earlier, um, there was a match against the Cats and you clearly liked playing against the Cats where you really unleashed the shackles. You got a best on ground, certainly would have been a three-vote Brownlow effort and, um, and kicked four goals. You remember that game? We just remember we were howling. You kicked some absolute long-range goals that day and uh, the supporters were up and about. Yeah, I think I end up getting a couple of good uh, good games when that sort of momentum of actually playing on someone, not like 04, 05. And yeah, yeah, there were some. Obviously, Geelong was my, my team that I actually always used to play quite well against. So, always used to bag a, a few goals against them and got concussed a few times against them as well. So, knocked down on a few occasions, and uh, which which happens. But uh, yeah, that, that was, uh, I think that them and that, I've always loved playing against the Adelaide Crows as well. So, coming back home playing against the team that you used to barrack for as a kid and then obviously really liked to play against well against Port Adelaide because they sort of traded me and wanted, wanted to offload me. So those were the sort of three clubs that I reckon I really, really had a good uh, a good hit out against over, over the journey. And, yeah, another one of those bag and four and um, and having an impact, which is which is really good. So, um, yeah, every time you can hit the scoreboard from outside 50 and, and have a fair crack at it, was uh, nothing, nothing better. So... And uh, lucky as a left footer as well for a fair while, I'll be able to go the wrong way. Everyone, everyone yeah. didn't realise you, you, and you used to just keep going that way and it seemed to keep working. So I think they do a bit, a little bit more research on all mm. the opposition these days to to make sure they've got them like a fine. And then there's a lot of foot left foot footballers in every team these days. So if your um, career was a bit later, mate, you would have played for Hawthorne. Hawthorne famously liked to recruit <laughs> left footers, didn't they? Yeah, they did. They did there for a while. I think uh, I think later might have had a conversation with them and maybe the ch- opportunity to come back home, but um, to Port Adelaide. But we were just playing too good football in the, those prelim years to actually to leave the Bulldogs. It was wasn't really an option, but to have those discussions just to see where it's at. But uh, now I was pretty comfortable where we are, and we had we're on a path, and thought we were uh, we're, we're on the right journey. But uh, as you said, kick here, or kick there, and Gia's goal that we thought was a goal, and all that sort of stuff. So. It is what it is, but uh, no, nah, it was um, it was some good times, mate. You're a prolific, prolific goal kicker. Um, tell us about tell us about your your attitude towards goal kicking. So clearly, it's something that became natural because a lot of players are hesitant to, to to have a crack at goal through team rules and whether they should give it off to the bigs or or whoever. What 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 were you backed by your coaches? Were you instructed to you know if there's an opportunity to kick goals or were you just natural? You had an instinct for for kicking goals. Yeah, I think I think I, I think I got the balance right towards the back end. Obviously, uh, on occasions with that left foot, you can actually get it inside, and then and, and you might and might get oppositions that actually just hover towards you because you because you are that left footer. But I used to always just reel and go if the if the goals were there or someone was on the move, just to try and get that angle right, and then uh, trying to hit them. That was sort of always the key. But anywhere from sort of yeah, that sort of fifty to fifty to. 60 meters you sort of have a look first see what's going on and if not just tuck the ball under your arm and have a crack and and that's what rocky gave me the license to do and um, he was pretty comfortable with me having shots and, on and hitting the scoreboard probably earlier i picked quite a few behinds like my first year i took me like 10 10 10 behinds before i got my first goal in, in my first year so i was lucky to stay on the side back then but uh, port adelaide for my first year but uh, no any instinct to have a crack is, and that's that's the game these days. That's what they all yeah. create and ask them to do. Bring your uh, bring your your talent to the table. We'll work on your deficiencies, but uh, if that's what you bring to the table, let's use it to the full of our ability to make sure that we're a better team. So, yeah, it seemed to work. Yeah, absolutely. And do you have any favourite goals as well, Nathan? Ones that really stick in your mind that you thought, wow, that was that was one of my best. Oh, uh, well, there's probably, I think Daniel Cross gave me one out the back at a Geelong game um, from outside 50 when we were, were in, in, in late and then um, kicked a few a few goals against Brisbane. I think one in a final, kicked three goals in a final, an elimination final at the MCG one day. And, uh, so there's that, some highlights of, of those those games. But I did snap one on my... Um, on my right at the at the Gabba one night against Brisbane, which was which was right on the boundary, which was which was pretty pretty uh, pretty good. But I do recall my the one I kicked late in the game in my two hundredth against Melbourne. Um, Gabba the ball um, from around yeah sort of fifty and just sort of wheeled around and and uh, and slammed the goal to probably seal the game, which was was pretty much a highlight in your two hundredth, which is uh, 
pretty pretty special. So, mate, yeah. I recall you kicking a lot of. I mean, not just miraculous or mercurial goals, but a lot of long range left foot goals. A lot uh, yeah. that were pretty outstanding, even though they were basically just like you said, you know, run thirty, kick sixty type of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that was the license I had. I used to be able to actually come right up the ground, so I might have got a t uh, possession in the back half, but that that was the idea, and that's just to keep running and creating. So you might might get in on the on the ha a handball, and then get into another one, and then just just keep trying to stream down the ground, and then and making giving ourselves opportunities to hit the scoreboard, and yeah, and that and that was sort of one of the one of the things I, I did kick a lot of behind, so. My accuracy was a little bit better. You never know. It could have been up close to that to sort of 300, but um, it is what it is. But uh, on occasions, you might have gone out there and kicked um, kicked one goal four or one goal three and thinking you got the yips and I'd changed my boots early days. But um, I think I've sort of found my way sort of in that back end. And that's what happens. You, you sort of mature, yeah. get a li little bit uh, more comfortable at the level and uh, get a bit more backing from your coaches and uh, and, and then you, you get that confidence to be able to – um, do what's do what's best for the team. Yeah, and in 2006 we started to get on the rise again. Um, and you were part of that historic record-breaking match that Chris Grant played uh, his club record game uh, in round 18, I think it was against the Tigers. Do you remember that uh, that occasion and how was it to line up against the great man? Yeah, yeah, no, it was, it was amazing. Obviously, he's uh, is a wonderful achievement for Chris and uh, doing some great stuff for the club at the moment and. Uh, and yeah, just to be able to play with in those big highlight games. Obviously, Chris had one, and then um, Brad Johnson's game as well. So sort of when he um, played that, I think it was three fifty one. I think, and uh, got the I've got the still got the two Guernseys today that we played in them ones that have got the got the, the special sort of uh, emblem on them, and uh, cherish them uh, uh, quite a bit. So they're um, some amazing sort of opportunities to be involved in, and um, it's uh, it's some of the highlights that. Uh, it's, it's, that I uh, still think of when when this sort of stuff comes up, which is uh, which is great to uh, have a chat about and uh, and remember those uh, opportunities. Yeah, and uh, later on in that year, we made finals. It was a long wait, uh, and then you ran out on the MCG against the Maggies in front of eighty five thousand people. What a day! Um, what are your recollections from from that occasion? Yeah, well, that was um, that was that was one. That's the one of the highlights. Game eighty five thousand elimination final MCG. Um, I reckon I did my hamstring about uh, three weeks earlier, so um, I um, I was touch and go for the for the game, but um, uh, was uh, playing some pretty good footy prior to that, and uh, and Rocket started me on the bench and uh, come on came on and had had a bit of an impact, so um, touch and go for that one, but it was um, yeah definitely the, one of the highlights of uh, of uh, of the career to get on the MCG playing Collingwood eighty five thousand is uh, nothing better and. Uh, and to see the Magpie Army up at the moment, the way they're playing, and and then the crowds that they're actually getting, it's always always been there for them. And uh, it was um, it was definitely a, definitely one of the uh, one of the highlights. Uh, I know the next week we went across the West Coast, and uh, I think we were we were pretty much cooked, and we uh, sort of got done by by forty odd, maybe fifty points after that one. But it was a good lesson. Uh, we knew where where we sat and what we had to do to get better, and then. Um, try to keep improving on those uh, next couple of years to actually have an impact in finals. But uh, definitely, definitely a, a great victory and great, great team to be a part of in that one. Yes. Yeah. And, um, and then in 2008, which you alluded to a little bit earlier, we started our famous run of three consecutive uh, prelims. Um, Brad Johnson said the 2009 one was the one that got away. That was the apex, but can you take us firstly to the 2008 final series and um, and how we started to grow with our belief? How was that? How was that uh, campaign for us? Yeah, no, it was it was a really good one, and uh, we had some some great momentum going into into the finals campaign and um, and playing some some quality football, and we had a had a great belief of, a, among among the group that um, that that we can uh, this is us, we are a top four side, and we're really. Um, really going to try and try and have an impact. And I suppose a couple of those games along the way early in that season, while we're playing North Melbourne at the MCG middle of winter and we're, we're probably down at three quarter time and we're trying to make sure we get these results right to be able to know that when we get to the, to, um, to make sure that we're in that top four. So there were the sort of ebbs and flows within the seasons to making sure that nah, our common boys got to dig deep here to make sure that we are, because we knew after what we'd been through that we're, 
that we uh, we should be here and we're meant to be meant to be uh, taking part right at the, uh, the the hairy end of the season. So um, yeah, momentum was great. Obviously, getting those opportunities probably um, losing the first one always hurts. Um, and that first final, and then um, and, and the opportunities go don't go begging. But uh, to be able to back it up, play another one quite convincingly, I reckon we always used to win those uh, those ones before getting into the prelims. And but um, always on the back of my mind is when we actually those three prelims that we did play, the the um, the winner didn't come out of those matches. The uh, we actually threw everything at those those prelims, and uh, and they didn't they didn't end up winning the grand final. So that's sort of the one little thing that sort of. I hang my hat on that um, we threw everything at them and uh, couldn't get out of the loan ourselves. But um, the following weekend, when those teams came up against uh, the opposition, they uh, they couldn't get it done either. So that's sort of one little thing I sort of hang my hat on a little bit. So, yeah. Yeah, there was there's not a lot of joy looking back, but um, you certainly hit them hard and gave it gave it, gave it your all. That's for sure. 2009. Um, let's talk a little bit about that because. Um, you know, I, I, I'm still traumatised by, by the ending of that 2009 prelim <laughs> final. Um, at half time, we went in with a lot of confidence and we came back running out onto the field and um, there was a, an innocuous bump that we've spoken about with some other guests, um, with Brian Lake and uh, Nicky Rewalt. Can you, can you talk us about how that momentum switched from there? Yeah, I think yeah that we we're, yeah we played a really really great half of footy and uh, and that was the way that um, Ross Lyon was playing them days they um, they'd always have an extra back they'd fall back they didn't want to they didn't want the game to be they wanted like, obviously not many good goal scoring and they wanted these opportunities late to to try and win games and uh, and that's sort of what happened throughout that uh, that that era and uh, and uh, it was. Uh, yeah, definitely a momentum change, and just one of those things that um, a little bit of a brain fade of Brian, and uh, and uh, just a, a little, not much of a bump, and 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 there you go, and that's sort of just the whole momentum of the of the game came. We still came out and played some good football, but uh, we just couldn't uh, couldn't hit the scoreboard on those occasions and uh, and getting the results. With and uh, it, it is what it is today, yeah. Mate, um, one of our one of our best guests has been Jason Arkamanis. Um, he was wonderful when he came on. He was a very controversial figure, a very extroverted type of much maligned player, opposed to your quiet demeanour. How did you find him and how did you get on with him when he was at the club? Yeah, no, I had no qualms with Aka. He was a, he was a good fella. He um, he he uh, was was good at what he did. I didn't I didn't mind uh, the way he went about things. When you've got, have have someone that's had that experience and no and those wins along the way that what he's had, you've got to actually sort of embrace that, learn from it, and uh, and and use it to our to hopefully to our ability. And he played some some really fantastic football for us. And uh, and then obviously just sort of. Um, the media sort of it always wanting to sort of bite, bite at him and try and get him to say something and yeah. and, uh, and 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 it seemed to sort of not work work for us as as a group. But um, uh, day to day, what he went, the way he went about it, so his foot skills on both sides of the booty of the footy and the ball, so was was through the roof. And uh, and he had a, had a lot to bring towards to the group in that uh, in those first couple of finals, and then. Um, yeah, we had Barry Hall come through as well for a while, and we sort of trying to trying to make sure we. I think early days we had a small little mosquito sort of forward line in that first couple of finals, and needed to try and find something. So we grabbed grabbed Barry Hall and uh, and and I had a crack with him as well, and kicked, he kicked over seventy goals for us, I think, in the season, which was fantastic. And uh, yeah, Acker was he was he was flamboyant. Um, we knew what he was going to bring to the table. We knew what he'd done in the past. He's not going to change his ways. He doesn't. He still doesn't today. He's who he is, um, and uh, and that's Acker. And you take it, uh, take it how it is. And as and as me as just uh, I, I I got on with him well and um, and and had uh, had some good times with Acker along the way for those couple of years for sure. Mate, Acker mentioned that as much as the uh, with Barry Hall joining the club, it was fantastic. He felt it affected his game as far as his potency as a goal kicker. How did you find it where you were instructed to kick it to Barry? Were you still given license to go do what you did before, kicking goals? Yeah, probably probably license to do what before, but I think um, maybe, I, and it was, it was great, maybe we just became, became too Barry-focused at the time. 
game's gone on with with sometimes I know we still all got had guys bobbing up and kicking goals, but um on occasions early there there might be eight to ten goal kickers that were going through and you never know who was gonna bob up. Mitch Hunter would kick a few, Gia kicks a couple, myself get on the get some goals and all that sort of stuff. Brad's down there as well, playing small forward or whatever he was doing. So sort of just kept all the all the teams off guard and sort of and we did we and, and Barry was amazing. We sort of needed to all be still popping up and kicking goals, but sort of became the role of as a wingman, sort of maybe kicking the ball to Barry quite a bit. Maybe I wasn't playing as much as half forward and, and, and more more through the midfield at that stage and, and later on in the in the career. So but um now and, and we had opportunities to win but all those three prelims. So it's not as if uh, if it, it, our structure went out completely out the door and we weren't in any of those matches, they are all they all probably could have been winnable games and uh, and uh, probably shots on goal that uh, I, I sort of sort of remember I missing a couple um, and that's sort of one of those things that yeah just sort of got away from us at the end. So, but uh, no, maybe for maybe, maybe for Acta because he's maybe playing a little bit more as a small forward down there, yeah. but um, I think I was a little bit higher up the ground and trying to probably hit. Probably hit uh, Barry a bit more than uh, and and Acker as one well as that small leading forward, which he was great on the burst. Acker, he was he was he was quick off the mark and could get away from his opponents and and kick goals from anywhere. So he was um, very dangerous when he was up and about. Acker for sure. Yeah, you were hampered with injuries in that 2010 season as well, Nathan. Um, but you clawed your way through to uh, to the prelim final, just like you know, like the team did itself. Um, so can you tell us what the missing ingredient was, I guess, just for us not to be able to make that, you know, that final step on any of those three years, but particularly, I guess, the the last two, which, you know, we felt that we, you know, we had a mature list and you've, you've touched on, you know, a forward line of John O and Acker and, and, and Barry Hall and, you know, a fit and firing midfield. Um, what was, why didn't we just make it to that last dance? Yeah, I, I still to this day, it's just one of those things, isn't it? It's so, it's so hard to try and put your finger on it, but um uh, we thought we had a, a, the, the core group that was um, Dale Morris was playing some great football down back and, uh, and Boydy running through Crossy. Like we, we had some, some, some legends and, and some great footballers uh, of our football club that are playing through there. And uh, it's just one of those things on the day. That, and that's what a lot of people have said. Oh, you just got to tip your hat to the opposition. They were just better on the day, apparently. Like, so that's just one of those things. It's hard to actually say, but there might have been a few little things here or there go, could have gone our way. But um, that was the year of where the game was. If that team was playing sort of up and down the ground these days where it's ebbed and flowing, it sort of would have fell into our lap quite nicely. So it's just one of those things. The, the game was trying to be closed down. It was um, there's tried not to get any room around around the ball to be able to move. So 6-6-6 six, six, six would have probably come in handy back then as well, those sort of <laughs> rules that, that trying to open up the game and making sure... But um, it is what it is. But that's 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 what we we're what we we're asked to play in, and that's what we did. And uh, we, I had no regrets on the way we all went about it and had a fair crack at it. But um, one of those things we just couldn't get over the line. And that year, I was sort of I had a knee surgery early pre-season, um, sort of clawing, as you said, clawing my way into the side. I think on occasions there, where I thought I was playing some um, some footy for Williamstown and thinking that sort of. Would have might might have been might have been the end, but just kept clawing my way. I knew I, if I we, we get to that that opportunity that I'm I'm a valuable asset to the team come finals, and um, and I was playing some pretty good football at the back end of 2010, and had a really good, not a bad game against sort of St Kilda in that last one, but sort of just couldn't just couldn't get to that final dance, and uh, it's pretty hard to pretty hard to be there on that final day, and decided on that in the change rooms after the game on. Um, that Footscray game, uh, that uh, St Kilda game, that uh, that'll that'll be it. And uh, told the lads the next day, and then I'm doing a doing a circle and going around the uh, the Toyota and the Hilux Hilux for the grand final, and announcing my retirement. So happened pretty quick. It, it um, but uh, it's one of those things that it does happen, and a lot of guys doing it this this week, and it always comes around pretty quick when they're playing early in the season. Like see the two Richmond lads on the weekend and uh, and Rewalt and. Um, Trent Cochin uh, retiring, and uh, it, it, it's a tough one, but uh, the game gets 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 you in the end. And um, it's uh, and I was 31, so these guys are lucky enough to be retiring at 34, 35 these days. So they um, let you stay on a little bit longer and, uh, and and playing out a few more games of footy. So yeah, it's um, so mate that that 2010 
that prelim you just mentioned there. So you, you lose the prelim. Um, you're walking off the ground and you're, and you're at your last game. What what were your what were your emotions like? Did you, did you allow yourself to feel any emotion about your last game, or were you still angry or emotional about losing that prelim? What what were those opposing emotions like for you? Yeah, pretty. Yeah, probably. I know um, Brad Brad uh, retired the week before, and I'm, I was pretty keen just to sort of sort of slide under the radar and sort of. Pretty, pretty much knew I was going to retire, but just sort of didn't sort of say anything and just kept it kept it to myself and just wanted to make sure I was concentrating on playing some good footy and hopefully playing in the GF the next week. So, uh, but then as soon as that game was done and um, and the uh, the year that I'd had, I was sort of knew straight away and probably yeah the motion sort of start to start to get to you and you start to realise that sort of that's 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 it and uh, and uh, have a little bit of a chat to the coaches and sort of chat to the playing group that following next day and sort of decide that now nah, that's uh, that's enough for me and I'll um, I'll be uh, I'll be hanging up the footy boots at that that this, this level so and then that's sort of yeah as I said happens pretty quick but, um, and um, and just decided that uh, on that night after we'd lost that um, yeah I'm gonna uh, I'm not won't be playing I won't be out of I'm probably good thing to sort of take one more look out here and uh, before going in them change rooms and uh, and that's the, the last hurrah so yeah another fascinating fact really quickly mate was you were the last of the Port Adelaide inaugural team uh to, to retire that must have been quietly satisfying for you in regards to leaving the club in the first place but you must have had some satisfaction out of out of, out of that fact yeah, yeah, and no, that's um, that's pretty. It's pretty good that uh, I think te- uh, Warren Treadway was the uh, sort of the last one, and then this sort of sort of then me. So, um, and I was lucky enough. I think probably helped where we were as a football club, um, really at the top pointy end of the footy, uh, of the of the ladder, and obviously contending for uh, for grand finals. And Port Adelaide was sort of sort of down towards the uh, middle of the middle of the row and uh, not really having after their 07 year, year they sort of sort of dropped off a little bit again so um now it was really um yeah pr- pretty uh pretty keen that uh, that sort of went my way and uh, to be able to um, manage to get that 277 and uh played a lot of Vansec cup and all those other um uh, wizard cup all those pre-season games to and state of origin and uh, international rules to be able to just get over 308, which is, um, wow. gets me AFL life membership, which is uh, which was pretty cool as well. So a couple of grand final tickets to uh, to the rest of my life to go and enjoy and go with Rowan and Brad and a few of those other boys that done at Westy and um, be amongst that group is, uh, is is pretty cool. Yeah, that sounds phenomenal, Nathan. Um, and it, look, you touched on um, some of your rivalries um, with with other clubs, and you know, particularly going back to Adelaide and playing against the Crows and and your old club in in the Power. Um, can you tell us a little bit about some of your uh, fiercest opponents, um, you know, that you really just love playing against and ones that you respect and admire and maybe even ones that you particularly disliked? <laughs> yeah, well, no, it's good going back a bit. But uh, Port Adelaide days, I reckon I was running around and actually playing some good footy and Alex Clarkson was against, like, playing for playing for Melbourne and, do, and doing what he did. So he used to come and come to me and the, the Scott boys, they used to run around and try and Jeez. give me a give me a hard time when one of them was at Brisbane and Hawthorne at that stage. So um, it's because I was probably creative and actually used that left foot quite well early days. Though some of the guys that suit used to uh, sort of get into me, but uh, um, that's come some of the challenges that I was going through when I was um, trying to tag, trying to tag like the likes of Crawford and playing mm. on Buckley and um, Robert Harvey used to do that little trick where he used to put his hands on his knees and you think he's done and then bang, he'd go to the next contest. So, and Ben Cousins also, Judd, so some of the guys are the sort of supreme athletes of our competition and um, lucky enough to play on them on, on occasions and then trying to do what I could against those. So, And then, um, yeah, on the back end of my career, it was probably, probably more me me going out there and having an impact and not sort of worrying about my opponents, which was really good and, uh, and sort of being on them and often, but um on occasions that guys come into me and trying to play on me, but uh, yeah, it was um, some of those early days and uh, what I was going went in those four and five. Some of the opponents were some of the legends of our game to be able to sort of try and run with them, play on them, uh, and uh, and have a crack against some of the best in in the, in the league was uh, was amazing. So 
uh, cool. But you returned to South Australia and, uh, you know, a champion, uh, a very successful career. You play at Norwood. Did you get that South Australian love when you returned? Did you get a lot of admiration and support from from the from the club and and from the spectators and the South Australian spectators? Yeah, I did. did. Norwood was uh, was a good experience for me uh, for a year, and uh, I was going to go on again for another year, but uh, I got a really quite a bad hip injury and sort of had to retire just before the start of the uh, two thousand and twelve season. So. But uh, no, it was uh, it was another one of those. I think I think it was one of those things where I used I was getting tagged at that level. There were still taggers running around in the SANFL, so Jeez. I just got sat on every week and uh, and trying to um, sort of couldn't display what I was trying to display. And, and uh, but uh, having an impact at that level, once again went back to Norwood and played some good footy on occasions and uh, played twenty odd games in that year and got to got to prelim day again and lost another one. So I think. <laughs> Maybe it must be me. So I sort of, <laughs> on the back of my back of my head, I'm going, well, that's, this is enough of this sort of stuff. So, I, um, but I, I wanted to back up again and, and have another crack at it because once again they were at top of the top of the and they didn't get it done in um, 2011 and uh, wanted to have a crack in 12, but played a preseason game, got a real got got quite injured and uh, and my hip was done and I uh, didn't have the uh, the running capacity and then the kicking and so. Um, Sort of, sort of d- decided to retire before the start of that season, um, just before round one, and gave myself, my body, a, a good rest, and then um, got the opportunity to go out to uh, Happy Valley, my local club, where I played my juniors from the under eights all the way through to under seventeens, um, and I always wanted to play when I was that age. I always wanted to play an A grade for that football club, A grade game, and um, I was lucky enough to um, play six games. And Matthew Dent was our coach um, at Happy Valley, so. Denty, um, I made, made sure I got there, recruited my brother who was at another club and two of my, my brothers were there. And yeah, all four of us got to um, play prelim day, got it done. I kicked five out of the you, school. You actually square. won. <laughs> and we won a prelim and then we went on and, and I was lucky enough to um, to, yeah, to win, a, win, a, win a flag with the, so full circle, as I said, man, all the way from juniors, all the way through. Hadn't played any grand finals, hadn't hadn't got there, but full circle all the way back, and to be wow. able to do that with my uh, with my three younger brothers. Uh, what was, was the was feeling like, awesome. mate, when you won that granny? I mean, you've played at the highest level with the greatest players. Just what was it? Was it a was it a genuine high for you when you when you'd won that granny? Yeah, exactly right. No, exactly. Right. That's always the feeling at any level, it's, or whatever sport you want to play. You want to sort of. You want to be on that last day in, in uh, September and making sure that you're the one sort of with that medallion around your neck and holding that trophy and having all those photos. So, and then and that was sort of took me all that time, but to do it at an A grade local uh, suburban footy club, uh, full circle after being on the MCG, as we talked about, 85,000 yeah. winning, winning games against Collingwood, to go full circle and to be able to do that in that environment at your local club that you, um, you played for and all I ever wanted to do was when I was a kid was play A grade footy. I was lucky enough to take it a little bit further, but I got to tick that box as well and play A grade footy and win a flag was uh, was pretty awesome and uh, yeah, really uh, in, enjoyed our uh, reunion, the twenty twenty two reunion, which is um, something that um, is is pretty cool to be able to do and go to a footy game, see the old guys that you haven't seen for a while, and and enjoy those uh, those afternoons, which is which Hello, is great. Get a little older. How long did it take you to get home? Make your way back home at four or five days? What would... Yeah, I was, no, probably not as probably big. I was a little bit older then. I was a young family, but uh, definitely had a couple of days at it. And sort of uh, Monday, Monday, sort of probably we'll cut it there and uh, and uh, enjoyed enjoyed the uh, festival of it and uh, down the down to, to a few laps around the uh, the few pubs around the area yeah. and uh, and back of the track. Good couple of after t- afternoons, and uh, yeah, Matty Dent was uh, was the coach, which is which is pretty cool. So that connection with the with the dogs as well. So um, yeah, it was a uh, it was a real, real highlight. And as I said, to uh, to be able to do it with you your brothers is um, is right up there as yeah. well. So fantastic, beautiful. Now we wish you had done it in these colours, Nathan. But uh, uh, so do I. Now I tell you, so still these days when you have these cat conversations, you get a little fired up about it. And, uh, yeah. What could have been, but uh, it is what it is. And as I said, just got to tip your hat to those opposition players that uh, were lucky enough to get there. And uh, and uh, yeah, but uh, the journey was amazing, and loved my of my ten years in Melbourne. But uh, 
pretty much packed up the car and and then and, uh, and uh, jumped out of there had business interests here and uh, and so straight into it over here and get over there a couple of times a year and uh, get to a couple of games so now speaking of uh, of grand finals or grand final campaigns in 2016 um you know the the the, the doggies big year in round 1 there's an urban myth going around Nathan I don't know if you've if you've seen that <laughs> doing the traps but um there was a myth that in round one, uh, Jason Johannesson had some hamstring tightness and uh, Bevo gave you a call and said, can you come and run out uh, for the doggies? Um, can you confirm <laughs> or deny whether this is true? Uh, no, look at him. No, that's not a... Uh, no, he didn't ask me. No, he didn't. But um, I've done a few hamstring as well. But um, they do look a little similar there. So, I mean, JJ. But no, he's a ripping fellow, JJ. And he's been playing some... Some quality football. He's got some uh, a bit of calf issue at the moment, so coming back from uh, from a hamstring as well. So um, yeah, he's um, he's a he's a ripping lad, and he's played he played some exciting football. Uh, obviously, that was a highlight for uh, at my time. I reckon it was uh, hard. I got had two tickets to the grand final, and wanted to get my two boys in there as well. Eventually, found a way of getting a couple of extras and. Um, I was pacing the uh, MCG for the whole day. I didn't have a drop of alcohol. I was that nervous, and uh, it was uh, it was a it was a tough game, but um, to watch. But uh, after half time, the boys um, they turned it on, um, and uh, JJ Norm Smith medalist and played some really great footy off half back and did some and kicked a goal late. And um, Tom uh, Matthew uh, Boydy was uh, was instrumental in that game and a few other lads. So and Dale Morris down back with his tackle on Buddy. Buddy Franklin late, so yeah, it was uh, it was a highlight for sure. So, yeah. listen, yeah, mate, yeah. quick question. Brad Johnson just talked about that he felt like the era that he played in was just the perfect, you know, era as far as competitive football and the way that your life was outside of football. What do you think of the modern game, mate? Is it is it is, would it be a game or an era that you'd want to play in? You would have been a you'd be a beautiful player today with your assets. Uh, the social media, the the bubble that players live in. What are you feeling around today's football? And is it better? Is it worse? The umpiring, the decision making, the rules. Yeah, well, it's it's just it's, it's sort of the way it is, and it's. I reckon I I wouldn't mind playing this this year for sure. As you said, my uh, my assets was my running game, the kicking game, um, being able to uh, to get through the the four quarters and and still have something in the tank was. Um, and that these guys are machines these days, obviously. Uh, you go, you go into the Bulldogs' rooms, and they're they're, they're all, all six foot, and they're athletes, and they run all day. And um, except for Caleb, whose uh, his foot skills are elite and, and yeah. through the roof. So, um, but um, I would have loved to probably play in this era. No, not 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 too much tagging. You know, they obviously laid on Dacos with uh, McGuinness at Hawthorne and the, and and stuff like that. But it doesn't happen too often these days. And then the way the games played, I probably would have loved to play in this era, but. I think uh, with the way social media is and the way um, you probably got to got to hide a li- little bit more. Uh, we used to always in Melbourne find a way to um, to, to better get out of the spotlight in, in in within Yarraville and Seddon and all that sort of stuff. I don't think the just the, the social media side of thing. There's a camera in everyone's hand. It's um it's it's a tough environment for these lads to be in at the at the moment. So, um, but it, it and and that's what the clubs do to make sure that they actually have the awareness. They have the they have these meetings to make sure that they're all trying to be making sure they're they're good good footballers and citizens and of the public. But um, that's just where it is. And uh, but I'd say I'd love to play in this era. But if the game was being played the way it was, and, and socially back when I was, it would be perfect. So yeah. uh, you can't have everything. So I was pretty happy with the era we played in. Yeah, some amazing footballers that I played with at the Footscray Footy Club played against some Jets and some legends of the AFL and was on the ground with them. So. Probably in hindsight, you'd say no. I'd leave it exactly where it was and sort of suited me, suited me to a T. So beautiful, beautiful, Nathan. Listen, we're coming close to the end of the podcast, and um, as we do with all our guests towards the end, without a word of warning, we're actually going to put you back in the hot seat. Okay, <laughs> now we've got a sixty-second bulldog brain quiz that we ask. Oh wow! Here we go. Okay, here and we listen- go. Um, we're going to give you a little bit of power. We're going to give you the option of two categories here. So. Um, it's either the 1990s as, as your category of choice or Bulldog debutantes. Which uh, which would you prefer? And, Nate, before you choose, our recent guests have gone very poorly. So can we yeah. have an effort? We need someone to smash it. Uh, well, so 1990s, I was 
I was I only got to the Bulldogs at 2000, so I was probably more of a Footscray, uh, sorry, a, a, maybe more of a, a Crows fan in the 90s. But uh, well, do you know what? I'm going to give you a chance then. Let's go to either the 2000s or Bulldog debutants to be a bit fairer with you. Oh. Okay. Yeah, all right. Well, if you've got, let's go 2000s then. That's I was there 2000 to 2010. Maybe I've got a bit of an idea of what's going Come on. Come on, Nate. Like... We need a, we need someone to take Dougie <laughs> off the top because we just couldn't oh. stomach it anymore, mate. He's so he's gloating. Oh, my Dougie, Dougie's all over it. So we'll see how we go. But <laughs> here we go. Know. All right, you can pass if you'd like. The the time will start after your first question. Good luck. The two thousands regular fullback Matty Croft kicked five goals in his two thousand and four farewell match. Is that true or false? Uh, false. He kicked six. It was true. He kicked five. Oh, sorry. I thought he kicked six. Him and garlic. Simon <laughs> Garlic. Nathan no, Eagle. That's right. Nathan Eagleton uh, kicked a career high seven goals in his first season at the Kennel. Is that true or false? True. It's correct. <laughs> da uh, Daniel Cross won the best and fairest in two thousand and eight. Is that true or false? True. Correct. Who was the two thousand and nine Bulldog leading goal kicker? Gene Syracuse. It was Acker. Brad ah. Johnson uh, replaced which player as captain in 2006? Uh, Scotty West. Ah, oh, Luke Darcy. Ah. Uh, in what year did Danny Southern play his final game for the Doggies? 2000? No, 99. Ah, oh, it was 2000. Ah. I said that first. Give him that one. I'll give you it. How many votes did Adam Cooney poll to win the 2008 brown load? This is right 20. on the siren. We know 20. you like shots after the siren. 20. <laughs> 20. How many was that? 20. 21. 20. It was 24. Oh. <laughs> well, That's all okay, remember, Nathan. All I can remember is the the the, uh, the burger ring and the and the cheeseburgers after he won it. That was and a good night, actually, going in to uh, see him in there after winning it. It was, uh, it was a ripping night. Cheers. Brilliant. Brilliant. Well, well done on that. Let's put your uh, your scores up on the board right now. Here they come now, Nathan. You're not at the top. I'm so sorry. Damn it. Damn it. I should have known Luke Darcy. There's a couple in there I should have known. I, just, it got I was to me. confident, Acker as well. I was confident. Acker. Yeah, I know. What's, what's okay. Hawk on? How many has he got? <laughs> Dougie, look, Dougie's on the top. He's, he's, uh, I think, probably about six or seven ahead of six you. Or seven. So, all right. Yeah. No worries. All good. <laughs> so, Nathan, we firstly we want to thank you so much for joining us on Inside the Kennel Podcast. Our supporters and fans are going to absolutely love uh, drinking up, you know, your your amazing journey. Um, so we'd love to end by uh, you just telling us if there are there any final messages for Bulldog fans, and also how would you like to be remembered. Oh, that, that, just the bald eagle. I think it's sat with me for quite a while. So um, I haven't haven't gone over to Turkey and got my got my hair done or anything. So <laughs> it is what it is. I uh, I uh, wear it proudly. And um, now that's uh, I enjoy. As I said, enjoyed my time over there. We had uh, had my ups and downs and flows early doors, but um, to be able to uh, to be able to play over there for 10, 11 years, uh, play over two hundred games for the club and uh, two hundred goals or so was. Uh, was was pretty awesome. Uh, got some great great friends that I've uh, met along the way on the journey, and some great supporters that have uh, been there over the time. And always welcome when I go back and uh, and uh, and see everyone. It's uh, it's a great uh, a great community to be a part of, and uh, and really cherish my time in Melbourne. And uh, and thanks for uh, getting me on tonight. It's uh, always great to uh, to think about all the uh, the times and the memories you had along the journey. Sometimes the good ones and the and the ones that you try to forget, but uh, it's uh, always a always a a great uh, great opportunity to uh, to talk about uh, your time and, and and Melbourne and and how the Bulldogs were over those journeys. So thank you very much, Nathan. You've been an absolute superb guest, very insightful. Thank you for your generous time. Just on behalf of Maddie and all the supporters of the Bulldogs who are just going to love this interview. Thank you again for being one of our special guests on Inside the Kennel podcast, Nathan. Thank you very much. Cheers, guys. Appreciate it. Go Dogs. Legend. Thanks, Nathan. Thanks, mate. Great work. Cheers. Red in my heart, white in my veins, blue in my eye, red, white, and blue in my brain.